even that is too much. Uh, okay. Yeah, so hi everyone, my name is Martin. I'm running a web development agency in Singapore called Bitmask. And um, well, today as, as the final talk today, I wanna just give some very quick and easy, super fast tips for Python beginners. So I guess most of you will probably know all of this, but I know that we have some beginners here today, so this might be helpful for some of them. Yes, I don't know anything. <laughs> Okay, tip number one is use virtual env. So maybe a quick show of hands, who is using virtual env? Oh, I, I know this one. <laughs> okay, so that is probably 90%, pretty good. Um, yeah, I believe for newcomers, this is uh, the very first thing that you should probably teach yourself and it's not very difficult anyways. Um, so why should you use it? It's to avoid the thing that we call dependency hell. So imagine, you have two projects, one project you need Django 1.5, the other project needs Django 1.6, and then on the, in the morning you start working on the first project, in the afternoon you want to switch to the other one, and you would always have to pip install the old Django, pip install the new Django, and you would have to do that all the time, waste time, waste bandwidth, waste this space, so that's not a good solution. Um, Virtual Env will help you to create isolated environments, so, as I said, you can, that is basically a result of avoiding dependency hell. Now you have buckets of environments and they don't interfere with each, with each other, so they are isolated. Um, it also means that you won't pollute your global environment. So, I don't really know if this is really an issue, but every time I do sudo pip install something, I'm kind of scared, what if my operating system is actually using requests version 1. whatever, and now I'm installing an older version for some reason, am I breaking my operating system right now? So maybe polluting your global environment might not be the best idea as well. And uh, you also, it helps you to create reproducible environments, so usually you will have this so-called requirements.txt file, and with a tool like pip or easy install, you can just say pip install everything that's in this requirements text and there's like 50 different uh, packages in them and then you go and grab a tea and you come back five minutes later and everything has been installed. So it's pretty good if you have a bigger team and you need everyone to be on the same page working on the same project. So how do you use this? You just run pip install virtual env. Um, you go into any project folder where you want to start working on your project and then you call this new command virtual env and you give it a name, usually we would use vnv. And then this will install a new folder called vnv which contains its own Python library and whenever you run, when you activate this environment, which we will do with source vnv bin activate, your shell will, get, will have some new environment variables and the path to the Python, uh, Python executable will be changed to the one that is in this VM folder here. So when you run which Python in your terminal, it will no longer go to user local Python or wherever it's installed. It will go to projects, my project, VM bin Python. And then uh, when you run pip install, it will no longer end up in whatever is your global folder. It will end up in this VM folder. So that means all the crap that you have installed during this project, you can easily delete it. You can just delete the VM folder and you can reinstall everything again, start from scratch if you messed it up somehow. Right? And by typing deactivate, you will stop using this virtual environment and you will go back to your global environment. So, um, yeah, as I just said, it, it creates a folder, VN, what you can call it, you can give it any name. Uh, it uses its own Python executable, it installs packages only into that folder. And by the way, if you're running a virtual control system like Git, you should not add this folder to your uh, repository because when you have many developers they might have different operating systems and they might compile the Python packages differently so you don't want to commit this into your repository. That's everybody's own business to install the packages and into this into their own virtual environments, right? So this is not, not something that is shared between the team. Everybody sets this up on their own computer. And yeah, there's the link um, where, where you can use it. Uh, so maybe a very quick demonstration. So when I go to my, oh wait, when I go into my projects folder, and I start a new folder, and then I say virtual env vnv, <coughs> 
And now I have this VN folder here. And inside of the VN folder, there's a bin folder which has the Python executable and the activate script. So now I can use source uh, VN bin activate. And usually you can see that your prompt changes and it tells you now you are basically running a virtual environment. And now when I do like pip uh, install requests, for example, uh, yeah, okay, I'm not online. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? I'm running my hotspot. Okay, never mind. So, yeah, so it would it would be installed into VM, lib, Python, site packages, and then you would find all the things that you have installed in this folder. So, if you want to browse the code and want to dive into the into the things that you are using, you can actually have a look at it very easily. Okay, so that's the first tip. Second tip is building on that. So if you are using virtual env already, you should also use virtual env wrapper. Hey, raise of hands, who knows about virtual env wrapper? Okay, so that's like only maybe 30% and I would have expected that. Most people somehow don't use it. And I don't know why, because it's really awesome. Um, <coughs> you will no longer have your VMs in that folder where you are currently working. You will, you will have an uh, environment variable called uh, work on home. And, and virtual env wrapper will help you to just install all your virtual environments into that single folder, right? Um, which makes it, is, I find it easier that I know where are all my virtual environments, where on my computer are they. If I want to go into one of them, want to delete them, want to mess around with them, I have one central folder, I just go into that folder and I know where I am. Um, and you don't have to remember the path to this activate script, like source, uh, projects, my project, VN, bin, activate, it's confusing. Uh, so virtual and wrapper basically gives you one command, it's called work on, and you say work on project one, and boom, the virtual environment with the name project one will be activated, no matter where you are in your terminal right now. And uh, with, yeah, with ZSH, it has plug-in, and I think with Bash, there's also a way to set up auto-completion for this, so when you are like me and you have tons of um, Virtual environments is super easy to activate them by using other completion. Installing this is also pretty easy. As usual, pip install virtual and wrapper. Then you need to put a few few lines into your um, bash profile, or if you are using ZS ZSH, I'm I'm putting it into ZSHRC, or you can put it into bash RC. Any file that is executed when you start a new shell, right? So you would use these new and new environment variables here. This is the most important one. Work on home. And then when you've done that, you can use this new command called mkvirtualenv. So you don't have to use virtualenv anymore because virtualenv creates a new virtual environment in the folder where you are right now, right? And mkvirtualenv creates a new virtualenv in this folder, work on home, which is your central folder for your virtual environments. And then you can activate it with work on and deactivate it with deactivate as usual. So um, when I run work on, and, have, and press double tap, I see all my virtual environments. And if I activate one of them, you can see that it has been activated. And I don't have, it doesn't matter in which folder I am, right? So I'm, I'm just going to my home folder and I can say work on this, or this one, for example, and that it is activated. So and then I have uh, this central folder here where all these virtual environments are together. Okay, this is tip number two. Yeah? When you work on that virtual environment, do you automatically go to the folder? Go to the folder? Uh, no. It's, you don't, it, no, it, you stay in the same folder. Yeah. So no matter where you're working currently, you can work on, you can just activate this environment and from then on, this other ISNet Python executable will be used. Right. Yeah? But if you want to go to the folder, yeah, you can. You, you can. Yeah, you send the CD into the yeah, there, is a, there is a convention you can use to put a CD. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. This is also uh, this, is pro ah, this is a good tip. So um, when I have projects, let's say this one, I can I think I'm not sure if this works right now. I haven't done it for a long time. I think you can put a dot file, vn. Is it dot vn? Here and then. Yeah, that worked. So when there is a .vn file which has a name of one of your virtual environments in it, and you cd into that folder, the environment will automatically be started. So you don't even have to type work on anymore. Is this 
a feature of VM or VM wrapper? I think this is a feature of VM wrapper. But there's also the, I'm in a different directory and I want to go to the directory of my project, right? There's the CD project. Oh, yeah, yeah, there is something like that. And there's also, uh, virtual environment there's also remove virtual env, so you can delete them without having to go into your central folder. And is there C oh, there's CD virtual env, so if we want to have a look at that. Ah, it's interesting. It doesn't have auto completion. Oh, it doesn't seem to work. I have never used that before. It does work. You just, if you just CD virtual env, it goes into the virtual env. That you're currently oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, they're Just currently like activated. Oh, that's yeah. not good. What he did then was when he said the CD version and building, he was trying to go into building slash building, which doesn't exist. Yeah, I see. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's pretty cool. Anyways, awesome reading the docs. <laughs> 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 yeah. All right. Well, so. Sorry. Yeah. One of my favorites to that is that you can add hooks. So when you create a virtual end, you can make it install Jedi and IPDB and all of that stuff. Okay, so because you use these tools all the time in every virtual app and then, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, I never use that because I always have a requirements text file anyways, which I need to, to run when I start a new virtual app, so yeah, I don't need hooks. Okay, last tip, um, lint your code. Python already has this awesome PEP8 coding conventions. Um, brought to us by our benevolent dictator, Guido von Rossum, and many more people probably. And I think this is the, one of the great things about the Python um, ecosystem. You can look at anybody's code and it just looks familiar because most of the people are following the PEP8 coding conventions. Um, so you don't have to waste time in your own company, your own team to set up a central document where you decide how the code should look like. It has already been decided for you. And um, it will also find some nasty syntax errors for you. Um, and it keeps your code beautiful. So there's a, there's a tool that helps you sticking to beautiful code, and it's called Flake 8. So you would run pip install Flake 8, and then you can run this command, Flake 8, Flake 8 on the current folder, and then it will look into all Python files and see if they are uh, compliant with the pip paid um, uh, conventions. So let's try that. Uh, let's just go to any project. Um, yeah. So let's say I have a file here which has pretty bad code. We, we will import star, which you should never do. And then we, we will have a super long line. Um, yeah, so let's have, and then we have some white space here and some white space here, for example. So that's pretty ugly. And when I run flake, okay. I need to activate it's not a virtual environment. Which one? Maybe this. Yeah, when I run flag 8, it finds this file Excuse and it finds it tons. It, 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 oh, okay, okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Like this? So, it finds this file, bad code, and tells me exactly on which line which syntax error has been found. Usually, they are already very easy to understand, so you don't have to go to some other documentation to find out what is this error all about. So it's telling me, oh, I have invalid syntax. Even. Um, why do I have invalid syntax? You're missing from decimals. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, well, what I actually wanted to do was this. In from decimal import star. Okay, so now I'm playing 8, and it says, I'm using star imports, and this makes it very difficult for my um, IDE to figure out which which modules are imported right now, like which which classes are available in this file, because I don't know what's behind star, right? So I should be more um, precise about what I'm actually what I actually want to use. So we will change that into this, for example, right? And then when I run it again. It says decimal has been imported, but it's never being used. This is one of the most, the one that I, that I like the most, because when your projects grow, you tend to import all kinds of stuff, you mess around, and then you get to a final solution, which is so easy, and all the stuff that you have imported before is no longer being used. So Flake 8 makes it very easy and tells us that we are not using it at all. So let's remove it, right? And then it's saying there's a, there's a line which is too long, so with strings we can use Something like this. It's still too long. You can see it, so we put it here. 
and then we have a blank line at the end of the file. And finally, it will not find any errors. And then we are good to commit our beautiful code. And uh, is there, if you are using Bit, uh, I also used it with Quick Fix Mode. Yes, okay, uh, yeah, sure. That's, which is um, even more beautiful. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say last. Um, most editors have Flag 8 plugins. So for Sublime, I guess uh, you have one for Eclipse probably as well. And even for my ugly little Vim, when I press, uh, no, wait. When I press F7, it lints the file for me and says Flag, flag 8 is okay. So let's introduce an error again. Let's save F7. And now it tells me line too long in this small window here. And when I, the cursor jumps here immediately, when I press enter, it jumps back to the line that is wrong. So when you have a file with lots and lots of errors, you can just step through those, press enter, and you will jump to the error, and you can fix them super fast. And what I found useful was that I've been using different letters that seem to have very different powers, like yeah. IDIT, yeah. PyFlakes. Yeah. And the flight eight have like completely different True. error messages, yeah. and sometimes they don't communicate the same thing. Yeah, we we did that as well in the beginning. We were using two or three different ones, but in the end we we settled on flight eight. The the latest version, I think they have it. It covers everything and it has the best error output. Yeah. And I think there's even a way to exclude some of the errors. If you say in my project, I I don't care about line too long, for example. There is a way I forgot how to do it because uh, I'm, I'm good with all the things that it suggests to me. But if, if you really want to exclude some of the errors, there is also a way to do it. It's probably in the documentation. It gets set up by email or something. Yeah. Online right. Emails. Yeah. Yeah. That's it for me. So I just feel like plugging him a little bit. If you do jazz development, you should check out his GitHub page for his company because they open source almost everything they do. <laughs> so um, a lot of good stuff to find there. By the way, um, is anyone here toying with? Oh, I don't have any. <laughs> 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 toying with the idea of uh, visiting PyCon later this year in June. Okay. In which PyCon? There's only one PyCon, Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> because we are still, as Bjorn said in the beginning, we are still uh, looking for proposals for talks. And I mean, we have super awesome keynote speakers, but that doesn't mean that everybody who's giving a talk has to be a super awesome rock star programmer, right? I mean, it's, a, it's an event driven by us, by the, by the community, for the community. So anyone who's doing anything interesting, I, I thought that the talks today were all super interesting and they would have been good fits for PyCon talks. So if you do something awesome, like you should submit your talk for, for PyCon, definitely. Okay. And um, yeah, if, if you think you're doing something similar, it, like with this scope, this would be a really good talk for PyCon as well. And you should consider submitting something. It's good for the community. Okay. So um, what, what do you do now? Do you have yes, we had PyCon APAC, yeah. 